on, don't you love the Lord? Let's give him one more good hand tonight. Can we? Isn't he good to us? Thank you, Jesus. I want to say how honored we are to be back here tonight and be with this great church and this good man of God and all of the ministry. I was thinking a moment ago how that there, and I mean this, how that earlier today, how that there are so many men here that could do uh, every bit as good and certainly better than what I do. Imagine that by the time Pastor Buxton gets back from the Philippines, y'all will be ready to throw rocks at me. <laughs> no, <laughs> will be a couple of weeks, but uh, I told my wife today, I said, you know, there's not hardly a camp meeting that goes by that they don't put Pastor Stephen Buxton on the, on the marquee to preach. And there might be a reason for that. He's one of the greatest preachers in Pentecost, I'll tell you that right now. And, and that's the facts. That is the facts. And we have enjoyed so much being here with Pastor, uh, Brother Rutland and uh, Sister Rutland. What a excellent spirit that they have. And I love to be around Brother Rutland and, and, and talk to him, one of my good friends. And I appreciate them so much being here and all of the ministry and all the wonderful, wonderful saints of God. I've often wondered why is it that in camp meetings we have only preachers to stand whenever the preachers would never have anything were it not for the saints of God sitting in the pews. What would be wrong with every once in a while having the saints stand and the preachers giving the, giving the saints a good hand? Thank God for good saints of God. And uh, I'm going to be very transparent with you here tonight. Um, th- th- this is really not my cup of tea, what I'm going to preach tonight. And I'm, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm going to open myself up for criticism. For someone to say, well, Perkins is missing that for sure. And uh, someone, but I'm just going to tell you early this morning, I was doing my devotional reading and uh, read the passage that uh, one of the passages I'll be referencing tonight and thought about this topic this morning uh, before I ever knew that I was going to preach tonight. <laughs> and uh, so, so I just feel like that, it's, uh, that this is what God would, would have us to, to hear tonight. And I hope you'll allow me that liberty to just, just convey what's on my heart tonight, if that's all right. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 and then we will go to the book of Psalm, chapter 139, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. And then again, Psalm 139 and beginning at verse 7. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, if you've got it, say praise the Lord. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that so that, in other words, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. I want to draw your attention, attention to the first two clauses in verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Psalm 139 and verse 7. Psalm 139 and 7. And if you've got it, say praise the Lord. David is writing and he says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? And whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. 
I want to talk to us tonight about a bedtime story. A bedtime story. God bless you. You may be seated. We read the uh, from the book of Psalms. And personally, I see David as a type. Um, I don't know about a type, but I see similarities between David of the Old Testament and the Apostle Peter of the New Testament. David is, is, is constantly making mistakes due to his impetuousness. Peter, the Apostle Peter, is constantly making mistakes due to his impetuousness. But David is quick to repent in the Old Testament, and Peter is quick to repent in the New Testament. There are similarities between these two. And David says that I, if I make my bed in hell, I remember talking to a um, man that uh, they go by, uh, they're Arianists, they deny the deity of Christ, and he made the statement to me, he said, I want to tell you that, that God does not send anybody to hell. He, he, he said, God's not, he said, God's too much of a loving God. He said, God wouldn't send nobody uh, to hell. I said, you know, I said, you're right. God doesn't send anybody to hell. David said, if I make my own bed in hell, behold, thou art there. God does not send people to hell. People send themselves to hell when they reject the loving Messiah. We reject a loving God. But I'm going to tell you that Jesus Christ warned of the horrors of hell far more than he spoke of the joys of heaven. Thirty three times Jesus warned of the horrors of hell. One hundred and sixty seven times we find warnings in the Bible about this place called hell. What kind of place could this be for Jesus Christ to say, if your right hand offends you, you chop that thing off. But whatever you do, you don't go to this place. What kind of place could it be for Jesus to say, if your eye offends you, you'd be better off to pluck it out of your head than you would be to go to this place. I'm just telling you we're living in a day where this generation has no fear of God. They scorn and they mock and they roll their eyes when you talk to them about absolutes and they don't understand that they're walking a spider web over eternity every day that we live. Brother, sister, we're not promised the end of this very night. We're not promised tomorrow, but we are promised eternity. And people today are making preparations for a future they might not even have. Instead of making preparations for an eternity, they're going to definitely have. I'll say it again. You're not promised tomorrow, but you are promised to stand before the judgment seat of God someday. David said there is but a step between life and death. It is the temporal world versus the eternal world. I remember being a, uh, before I got in church, I was working construction down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We had these boilers uh, that that we would go in and and clean at night. and, 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 And we would go into the boiler. And then there was a little place down further into the boiler. And I remember being down there one time, one night, and was there by myself and and the uh, the lights went out. We had electricity going down there, but the lights went out. The guy I was with went up to go find out what happened. And I'm just telling you that I, I, I sat in that darkness and I knew that I was not right with God. And it began to weigh on my mind. You could not. It was like you could just taste the darkness almost. It was so dark in that place. And, and I just sat there and just stared and nothing to stare. But I just looked and, and I just thought, my God, I'm not right with God. And I began to think about that place called hell. And it began to work. Such a fear of God got down in my heart that night. I'll never forget. 
that that night. But 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 I, I want to tell you something that that in the in the earthly realm, in the natural realm, the physicians they 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 work with their instruments. If you have a cancer, if you have a a surgery, or if you have anything, the the earthly physicians will work on your physical condition with some instrument and and they work with their hands and but sometimes there comes a time where the the earthly physician has to just throw down his instrument and walk away and say ma'am sir there's nothing that I can do for you I want you to know that just as the earthly physicians have instruments so our heavenly physician has instruments and he works with that on his hand and he gave some apostles and he gave some prophets and he gave some evangelists and he gave some pastors and he gave some teachers for the work on the body of Christ. And just like there are times that the physical physicians has to throw down their instruments, just so there are times that God has to throw down his instrument of the preacher and say, I've worked with them long enough. I have dealt with them long enough. Let me tell you something. There was two trees in the New Testament, two fig trees in the New Testament. One was spared. The other was not spared. Uh, Jesus uh, walks up to the fig tree and he and, and he sees the fruit or rather he sees the leaves, but he does not see the fruit and, and he curses it. It's a picture of of hypocrisy. Really, it is a picture of of of, of confession without profession and without really doing seeing the fruit. And, and Jesus curses it and he says, let no more uh, fruit grow on you after this day and it withers away. But then he tells a parable of another man in a vineyard and the owner of the vineyard comes to to see the keeper of the vineyard. And there is another fig tree. And 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 he says, what is the deal with this fig tree? Why is it cumbering the ground? Why don't you cut it up and and get it out of here? It's not doing any good. And but the difference was that 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 fig tree had someone to stand in the gap and to make up the hedge and that fig tree tree said rather that vineyard keeper said oh lord let me dung around it a little bit let me work with it a little bit longer and see if i can't salvage it i want to tell you something you better thank god every day you live you got a pastor to stand in the hedge and make up the gap and say hey god i know there are issues i know there are shortcomings i know about this and i know about that but god let me work with them a little bit longer let me dung around them a little. thank god tonight for a pastor that stands in the gap and makes up the hedge. And I'm just telling you, I remember in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, some years ago, 20 years ago, I was working in a construction plant and and, and this, uh, this guy told me, he said, come here, Perkins, I want to show you this scale. It was a digital scale. And he took a little piece of dirt off the side of it and just barely dropped that dirt on that scale, and those red numbers started lighting up. I mean, those, that scale was so sensitive that it picked up any little thing. I want you to know tonight that God's scales are very sensitive also. He notices that little bit of rebellion. Oh, yes, he does. He notices the self-will. He notices a stubborn heart. He know any little thing, it pops, it registers on God's scales. I'm not saying he's looking for reasons to, 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 to send people to hell. You know what I believe. I preached here long enough to, you know, I believe he's a God of compassion and mercy and that he wants to save us. But beware lest you only, uh, uh lift up and exalt the softer attributes of God because yes he's a God of mercy yes he's a God of compassion but he's also a God of wrath he's also a God of fury he's also a God of indignation oh praise the Lord and I'm just telling you uh, that, that they say uh, some of the area in this and, and others I've heard them say 
Well, not so much the Arianists, but, but I've, I've heard people say before that God is love. And since there can be no lust, love in hell, that means God is not in hell. All you do are not knowing the scriptures. Yes, God is love. But as I said, he's also a God of fury. And, he, and God is in hell. We just read it tonight. But the difference is there'll be no more altar calls in hell. There'll be no more preaching in hell. There'll be no more sweet touch of angels' wings in hell like we felt when the choir was singing. God is there, but He's not a God of love there. He's a God of fury. If you want mercy, you'll get it right now. If you want grace, you'll get it right now. After that, it's too late. It's over with at that point in time. I'm just telling you, if I make my bed in hell, God is there. I remember being in a, in a, uh, and we did prison ministry when I first got in the church. And I remember one day we are in the prison and we're, and we're teaching and preaching, whatever. And this guy, this guy enters in, one of the guards enters in and he comes, he comes around and I knew we still had some time left. I didn't, I didn't know what he was doing there. So I eased over there and talked to him, had another guy with me talking to him that night. And, and, um, uh, he said, he said, look, uh, Ms. Perkins, he said, we've got a guy in the population that uh, he, he, he's HIV positive, okay? He said, and we can't have him mingling with the rest of the community. He said, but, but he would like uh, some, some services by the ministry. Would you mind going to talk to this man outside of his cell block and, and just talking to him? I said, well, sure, I'd be glad to. And, 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 and so we, we went there, and, and, and as we were walking down the hallway, I just, I just started getting emotional a little bit and I went into the um, went into the guard shack and we're looking around and, and the reason why is because you gotta understand I had spent almost a year in that same prison and now God had opened the doors for me to go into that same prison and to take the shackles off my hand and put a Bible in my hand and to preach the word of God to them people. Yeah, I was getting a little emotional. I sure was. And so I, I walk up, they, they bring us to the place where the guy is, and, 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 and man, I get even more emotional because when they brought us up there, I thought, I can't believe this. And, 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 we, and we walk up, and it was the same cell block that I had spent many, many nights on my back in that cell on the other side of the, of the, of the jail cell. Now I'm on the other side with the Bible in my hand, preaching the Word of God to this man. I want to tell you something. He repented of his sins. We baptized him in Jesus name a few weeks later. I just want to tell you something tonight. God's able to take you, ma'am, sir, pick you up and turn you around so fast it'll make your head swim. But you got to stay in the church. you got to consecrate your ways to God more than coming to church, more than being a Pentecostal. But you got to have a relationship with God. And if we were to tour tonight the prison of hell... I'm just telling you that it's, according to Scripture, it's pitch dark. The smell of burning flesh. You say, oh, that ain't Bible. Oh, yes, it is. Bible said that we shall receive a glorious body like unto His. But the rich man that was in hell, he could see, he could speak, he could hear, all of that. And hence, we will have bodies glorified in heaven. And there will be bodies prepared for those that go to hell also. And I'm telling you that as we drag our chains down the hallway of hell's floor, and you can see the beds on death row, if you please, no doubt we would walk up to the rooms and the cells. And as we approach the first cell, we see written over it the angels that fell. And there they are. Can I tell you something? There was no alcohol in heaven. There was no marijuana in heaven. There was no cigarettes or cussing in heaven. There was no snuff in heaven. There was no Hollywood in heaven, thank God. There was no things of the world in heaven. There was just rebellion in their hearts. And God said, that's enough for me to cast you down. I'm telling you, you don't have to be a cigarette sucker you to go to hell. You don't have to be a cussing to go to hell. You don't have to be drinking to go to hell. You can just have rebellion in your heart against God-ordained authority, and it's enough to show up on God's scales. 
Oh, doubt we hear someone screaming down the hallway and we hear a man screaming, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And it's a man by the name of Cain. Oh, yeah, he's there. Then we keep walking a little bit and we see Jezebel in there, the first lady in the Bible that painted her face. She's there. We keep walking and we see Solomon there had a problem being loyal to his one wife. (laughs) Oh, praise the Lord. Had a problem running around with other women. Praise the Lord, somebody. And then we see Demas as we keep walking down the hallway of hell. I want you to know that, again, he did not uh, suck cigarettes. He did not have a cussing problem, no doubt. But he just simply had a love of the world in his heart. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. I'm just going to tell you that all you've got to do is have a love of your heart, a love of the world in your heart, and it registers on God's scales. Love not the world, neither the things that are of the world, neither the things that are of the world. Are you hearing that? Neither the things that are of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Friend of the world, the enemy of God. And, 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 and I'm just telling you, it's nighty night time in this bedtime story as the demons unfold and, 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 and uncover the sheets and you tuck your own self in. And I submit to us tonight that we'll hear the lullabies of hell and it won't be hush, hush, little baby, don't you cry. But I'm just going to surmise that it'll be the songs of Zion. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air. Some glad morning I'll fly away. But I'm telling you, all you can do is lie in that eternal bed listening as eternity rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls. I remember when I was a boy, my my Uncle Ricky would take me and and, and he would get me over a bed and he'd one, and two, and three, and he'd throw me up and I'd bounce up and Again, 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 you know. And, and he, he'd do it over and over and over. And, 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 and I'm going to tell you something. Who or what is swinging you tonight over the beds of hell? What family member? What little habit that you've got? What job situation is going on? What love of the world? What improper relationship is swinging you over the beds of hell? I want you to know that, that, that there are some who say that any writings of hell in the Bible is simply parabolic. It's simply a parable. No, sir. It's not a parable. Revelation 14 and 8 said that, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever. And ever, and they have no rest, neither day nor night. I'm telling you, there is no doctrine of annihilationism, all right? I'm telling you, there is a consciousness of those that are in hell tonight, and, and they just can only lay there and scream. It is my suspicion that those that enter into hell will have to pass by a shredded Messiah hanging just outside the gates of hell, God saying, this is what you you rejected. This is how much I loved you. I'm just telling you tonight that the blood of Jesus stands between you and hell. And I'm telling you, you don't have to go to that place, but you can go to heaven and be with him forever and ever. It's not his will that you go to hell, but it's his will that we be saved. As their worms dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I've heard people quote it, uh, the worm dieth not. It's not a definite article. It's a possessive plural pronoun. Their worms. What worms? I don't, I don't, I don't possess worms. Jesus, what, what, what? Listen, when you die, within days, skin worms begin to eat on your flesh. When there is no more flesh, they die because there's only bone. Jesus says, in hell, this is a place where their worms do not die. What kind of place is this tonight? I can only, my mind cannot even go that far. Why I hardly ever preach on it. My mind cannot fathom uh, the unbearable amount of pain. And it's so hot and there's no fan. There's no air conditioner. There's no getting out as the demons gnaw and the lost souls gnash with their teeth. And we can only hear the lullabies of hell. And we're chained to our bed forever, forever, forever and ever. But wait, 
somebody's coming in our cell. Maybe this was all just a dream. Maybe this was just something that they told about in some Sunday school. Maybe it's not real. Somebody's come. Maybe they're coming to let us out from this horrible dream. But, but wait, I, I think I can recognize and make them out a little. Oh my God, it, it's, it's my baby girl. It's, a, it's my baby boy. What, what in the world are they doing here? And they're coming in and they're crying and they're saying, Mama, Daddy, why didn't you follow the pastor? Why didn't you teach me about holiness? Why didn't you teach me the doctrine? Why did you just bring me to church all the time? But you never took the time to teach me of the ways of God. Why did you scorn and mock and belittle holiness? Why did you roll your eyes? the pastor. Well, I gotta go now, mama. It's my bedtime. And the child walks away slowly dragging their chains and the only nightlight is the flames of God's wrath. I know you don't want to hear this tonight. I know you'd rather me shout you tonight. But I gotta obey what's on my heart tonight. I'm just telling you, I know this is offensive to our senses. But there's still a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. I think about my mother's lullaby. My mother took me when I was three years old. And I've never really known my biological mother, a little bit here and there. And and I remember one day after I shortly after I'd gotten in church, I was at mama's house and and I come across some old pictures. No one was there, a big old huge house. No one was there, I had it all by myself and way, way, way down in the country of Louisiana. In, in the country woods, and, and, and I'm, uh, I'm there, and, and I found the pictures, and, and it was pictures of her and I, as a, I was a two-year-old little boy, and she takes this two-year-old little boy, and she begins to, 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 to raise him, to nurture him, to take care of him, and, and, and whenever, uh, his biological mother just walked away from him, and, and, and this, this good lady takes, and I saw all the pictures of her smiling, and me smiling with her, and all that, as I began to, to, to look at that, and, and it just pricked my heart so bad, uh, and I just started, I just knelt down by her bed, and started to pray over her bed, and, and before I knew it, man, I'm telling you, it felt like my guts was being poured out, praying for this lady. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I love mama, but I'm just telling you the books on everybody tonight. I don't make exceptions just because of my family members. She's got to repent of her sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Ghost and live a holiness life just like everybody else. And I'm just telling you, I think often of her lullaby. Revelation chapter 8, the Bible talks about the angel that had the censer. And he cast it to the earth. And he says it was made with the prayers of the saints. And he cast it to the earth. Verse 5 says, and, and, and when this happens, that there was all kinds of, of noises and winds and all kinds of tribulation that takes place. And, and, and in verse 5 it says, and also there were voices that take place. The Greek is, is, is phone, same word as John 3, 8. And it means dialect or, 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 or language. In other words, those that are here, whenever God pours out His indignation and His wrath upon the world, you know what they're going to hear? All of a sudden, Mama's going to be somewhere, and all of a sudden, she's going to hear a voice that she recognizes, and she's going to hear her boy laying by her bed, weeping and crying out to God, God save my Mama, God save my Mama. I'm just telling you tonight that we can make our own bed in hell, But I pray, God, that none of us have to go there tonight, but that we will still in the land of the living and we can make our calling and our election sure. The only dreams, if I can say that, dreams, are that you're back on earth and hearing preaching again. The only dreams is that you're in a Sunday night hilltop tabernacle service one more time. The only dream is that you think I've got another chance. This was all. No, listen, I'll say it again. If you want grace and if you want the mercy of God, you'll get it right now. Because in that side, there is no purgatory, honey. On that side, you will be either will either be in heaven or in hell. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Luke chapter 16 teaches that those that are in hell 
that they, they are aware of the circumstances and the events that is going on, on, on the earth while they're going on. The rich man knew the condition of his brother still, even though he was in hell. And I'm just telling you that I can imagine that if that's the case, there's not a whole lot of preachers preaching this tonight, you understand. And I can imagine that this message tonight right here is one of the most important messages that could ever ring throughout the halls of hell and I can just see them in my mind's eye shuffling across the hallway of hell with their hands reaching for this altar wishing to God they were where you're sitting saying to me hold them there boy don't let them go son I know they're tight on you I know they don't want to hear it I know they don't like it but whatever you do don't let them come to this place Telling you that the human mind can't bear as you stand at the judgment bar of Christ. And it's goodbye forever to that mama. Goodbye forever to that husband. Goodbye forever to that son. Goodbye forever to that daughter, to that spouse. I'm asking somebody tonight, don't make your bed in hell. I remember in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, some years ago, there was a brother, Ben Robertson. He was drummer down there, fine, fine man, and he, fine Christian man, and he, he, uh, he was witnessing to a guy named Neil, and Neil kept saying, yeah, Ben, I'm going to be there. I'm coming to church. Yeah, Ben, I, I, I'll come. Well, some time of this goes on, and we get the phone call. That Neil is in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in ER, excuse me, in ICU, and he's in there. He had a horrible wreck, two, three in the morning, and he's just all messed up. It was horrible. So we went there many times, many times. We would sneak in and pray for Neil, and and we went there one time. Me and this for a friend of mine named Darren, and and and, and we went there and. And we stood there trying to just pray. I'm just telling you, I'll never forget. Neil lay there. His eyes were closed. And, and it was such an eerie uh, a feeling that was there. His sister uh, sat there and everybody was just staring. And, and, and all of a sudden, I mean, I'm telling you, such a spirit of death was there. We knew if God did not intervene uh, that Neil was not going to make it. And I'll never forget the day that his sister sat there and looked at him. And she just began to sob a little bit. And before it was over with, there was such a shrill cry that was going through that place uh, as it was obvious that the death angel was making his his way. And we would talk to Neil, no response. Uh, we would ask him to move a finger, no response. Uh, he was just dead, and uh, not dead, but just on his way to being dead, but could not hear, could not respond. And, and, and I think of that often, uh, and I think how many people and how many times has the pastor stood beside your bed, so to speak, and preached to us the Word of God, only to have no response. Just sit there and look and stare away. I know a church right now, you can preach it to them, and they walk out the door and they no different than what they walked in. I'm just telling you tonight, I'm not interested in just coming to church. I'm not interested in just being a Pentecostal. I don't want to go to hell. And I don't want you to go either. And that's why I'm preaching this tonight. There was some years ago in England a fire in an insane asylum. And there are stories of the uh, of grown men as the timbers are falling down uh, grown men who didn't know any better obviously their thinking has been rearranged you understand and, and and they would they would get in their little bed and pull the sheets up over them as if that's going to stop the timbers from going from falling on them and the fire from falling on them uh, grown men would run screaming into the fire and and they would be trying to save their little tonka trucks and stuff they're just they're they're, they're thinking 
everything has been rearranged. And we say, well, that's just for the challenge. No, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people in the churches today that their thinking has obviously been rearranged. And they try to hide from the timbers of hell and from the fires of hell behind this excuse and that excuse. Every excuse in the world not to be in church. Every excuse in the world not to live for God. I'm just telling you tonight, whenever they stand before the judgment bar of God, they would to God that they had one more prayer meeting, one more church service in Hilltop Tabernacle. Oh, come on. I know y'all don't want to hear this tonight. But I'm just here to remind us there's still a hell out there. I know you want me to shout you, but I'm here trying to help somebody tonight. Brother Darian Hush, I heard him tell this story some years ago. He said, said that there was a, 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 a young uh, man at the youth camp that they were, they were attending. Said that the young man, uh, as time would go on, you could tell a little bit of difference in him. Said he was very talented. He could play, but and from year to year, there was just something that was out of kilter with the guy. Little things that began to show up and cause alarm. As time continued to go, it just kept getting worse and worse. He wouldn't pray and wasn't in just little changes in hairstyle here, little changes in, in this and that. Listen, it's not just a little checklist of rules, you understand? It's that there is a change taking place in the heart and it is manifesting itself outwardly. And it's the little foxes that spoil the whole vine. And and. and and just a little change begins to show up. Little worldliness in the hair. You, you, you know where the first place leprosy showed up at uh, was in the hair. You know when people are first starting to backslide. You know what will happen. Uh, sin. A little change here and there, brother. Little get attention here and there. Little thing, brother. There is a change that is taking place uh, in that heart. Uh, and there is a love of the world uh, that is taking root in the heart. And this man begins to... Begins to just, just slip away. Finally, he just quits coming altogether. And Brother Hush said that one day he gets a phone call from another preacher. Answers the phone and the preacher is weeping, sobbing uncontrollably on the other end of the phone. He said, hey, he said, did you, did you hear about brother so and so? He, he said, no, I, I ain't heard nothing. He said, I, I haven't seen him in some years. I've been worried about him. What's, what's the deal? Said that, well, you know, he wasn't doing so good in, for God, really struggling, really. And said that he, he was rounding a corner right in front of the church and said that he rounded that corner and lost control of the vehicle and it flipped and flipped and said the pastor was in the parsonage and he come running out and as he came running out the vehicle was totaled but the music player the tape player was still going and as he walked up and approached the vehicle he heard the old song by ACDC entitled I'm on the highway to hell and the man was sitting there literally he was on the highway to hell and he didn't make it. But I'm telling you tonight that you're still in the land of the living. And that don't have to be your lot. Young lady, if there's a love of the world starting to get in your heart. Oh, come on. Let me talk to the young people a minute. Young people, if there's a love of the world starting to get into that heart. Little change here. Little change. I'm just telling you tonight. There is something that's going on. And you better put that in check real quick. And I will never, ever understand the people. Listen to me. Can you just imagine? Let's see here for a minute. Eternal bliss with Jesus or eternal wrath in hell. Hmm. Which one will I choose? Let's see. I'm just telling you, brother, that is insanity. Do you understand me? I'll tell you, if we really believe what we say we believe, and I'm preaching to myself, understand, I'm just telling you I wouldn't allow some of the little attitudes in my life that pop up every now and then. I'd be more careful. I'd be more circumspect in my walk with God. I'm telling you, we're going to stand before God one day and give an account of the things that we've done. 
Luke 16, I'm almost done. I'm going to tell you, Luke 16, the Bible says, uh, says to the, rich, the Bible said of the rich man that he saw Abraham afar off. You understand what that means? That means that those that are in hell can see those that are in heaven. They can see, you understand, you'll see your pastor. You'll see those other church members clothed in garments made white by the blood of Jesus. You'll see them worshiping Jesus. You'll see that gentle breeze on their face. You'll see their joy. You'll see their love. And you'll feel only remorse and hatred and anger. You say, oh, you don't have no scripture for that, Perkins. Oh, yes, I do. Perkins don't get in the pulpit and preach what there ain't no Bible for. Luke 13 and 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out, you'll see Moses. You'll see Abraham. You'll see Jeremiah. You'll see the Apostle Paul. But you can only hear the lullabies of hell. I want to tell you that the bedtime stories will not be Goldilocks, but I submit to us tonight that it'll be there was a man from Galilee whose name was Jesus. And I'm telling you, you'll hear that over and over and over and over. I'm telling you, you'll hear the sermons. You just might hear this one over and over and over again. But I'm telling you tonight, you can turn from that scene. Young man, young lady, you can turn from that scene. I wouldn't leave here tonight if I wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost and talk in other tongues. The young man in Leesville, Louisiana. I'm done. I'm going to tell you. A young man in Leesville, Louisiana. He was in church having some problems. And he, he, well, I'll just read you the letter. How about that? I've got a copy of it right here. He wrote a letter. Brother and Sister Cox down in Louisiana a long time ago now. And he said, Dear Brother and Sister Cox, the devil has got me to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. I will be in hell in a short time. And the songs that we used to sing torment me unbearably. I see the demons bidding for me. They have come for me. And the thought that I was once saved in church will torment me unbearably forever. Signed Marvin Hank. They found him at the courthouse. He had taken a gun and put himself out into eternity. Now the horrible thing is, watch how Satan works. His thinking was rearranged there. It was all distorted. Now, after Satan has got what he wants, uh, he thinks clearly. But it's too late. Uh, the man, the rich man in hell, his clear, he, his thinking was clear. He had an understanding that he didn't have while he was on. Listen, Satan can rearrange your thinking and get you all messed up in your thinking. That's why you've got a shepherd. That's why you've got a pastor. Submit yourself. Obey them that have the rule over you. And so he knows what he's doing. God has set a watchman on the wall. And in Bay City, listen to me, I'm done, but listen, in Bay City, Texas, some years ago, there was a tongue interpretation that went forth. Brother Verbal Bean was preaching. I read it in his book. And he, he here is the interpretation. Pastor Cole was the pastor there at that time. And the interpretation was... And Brother Bean had it, uh, wrote it down, and it was that unless you repent tonight, you will receive instant destruction, and your children will look into your cold face and tell you goodbye. Some few days later, it was only a few days later, there was a funeral there at the church. Brother Cole said that he did not realize even the interpretation that went forth. But he said when he picked up that little baby girl and he put her in her arms and told her to look down at her daddy. And she said, he said, baby, tell your daddy goodbye. And then he realized that interpretation that it went forth. I'm just telling you, it's not time to play church. It's not time to play with God. God's not some tonka toy. God's not some play pretty. Can I be honest with you? This morning in the bathroom there. At the hotel saying, God, help me to be more sincere in my walk with you, God. Help me to go back to the days when I walk so carefully. God, I want to be right. I said, I want to be right.
And Isaiah 33 and 14 said this, Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting fires? Who among us shall dwell in everlasting burnings? And as much conviction as there is in this place right now, in all likelihood, there is probably, in a crowd this size, probably one person that will probably spend eternity in hell. And I hope not. I hope you make me a false prophet. I'm not saying it's going to come to pass. But I've been preaching long enough to know people. And I've been, when you got a crowd this big right here, I'm just telling you, who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Who among us will be the first to step over that pride and say, God is talking to me. God save me, God, from this ungodly generation. When we stand right now. The lullabies of hell. (laughs) Come on, church. (laughs) Come on, what will you do with this message? Will you shrug it off tonight at the opinion of the preacher? Will you shrug off conviction again? Or will this be the day that you give everything to Jesus? I'm just telling you, there's some friends you need to sever yourself from. If they're not sold out to God, you need to sever yourself from them. Come on, church. (laughs) The lullabies of hell. Why take a chance? It's forever. It's not just a little while, but it's for, where's the fear of God in our hearts? Where's the fear of God in our churches anymore? (laughs) Eternity calls tonight. The hallways of heaven call tonight. Make your calling and your election sure. What's in that heart? What's in that spirit? I pray God all the time. God forgive me. Every day I repent of something. Come on church. Come on church. Hey, hey, I'm not trying to come on too hard. Please forgive me, but there's still some of you looking around and, and kind of blase. I'm telling you, uh, there's gonna, there's a hell someday and there's a heaven someday and you choose this day who, what, whom you will serve. Don't try to analyze me and don't try to read me. I'm just trying to help somebody tonight. I preach this because I love you, not because I'm trying to hurt nobody. What will their first night in hell be like, Daddy? What will their first hell be like, Mama? (laughs) Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord... We persuade men. I'm here tonight to persuade somebody. (laughs) Come on, church. Send up a lamentation before God. Send up some supplication. As soon as I in travail, she brought forth her children. Love of the world, bitterness, hatred, unforgiveness, variance, strife, malice. Come on, church. (laughs) Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. (laughs) 
Come on, how can some of us sit here not moved by the Spirit of God? Not because I'm preaching it. Because He's here. Come on. Who among us? Who among us? <laughs> Come on. Come on, church. God, in the name of Jesus, God. in the name of Jesus, God, touch us, God. Break in our hearts, oh God. <laughs> Come on, that's it, church. Come on, that's it. (laughs) Come on, break up the fallow ground of your heart. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Come on, what about that attitude? Come on, church.
Come on, church, that's it. Old apostolic fashion prayer meeting. Crying out to God. <laughs> Crying out to God for mercy. God, remember mercy in thy judgments, O great King. <laughs> Come on, that's it. <laughs>